Good morning from New York City. I am super stoked about today's episode. I received a WhatsApp message from a dear Constance listener who happens to be a good friend of mine by the name of Cynthia Morris. Her message said, I would love to interview you for your podcast about your trip and your return. I didn't understand at first. And then it dawned on me that she wanted to interview me. And she said in her PS, did you know I wrote a book about coming home from a big trip? It's called The Graceful Return. And I'll tell you more about Cynthia in a minute. Anyway, I have been back for less than a month from my six-month sojourn, and we did this interview almost two weeks ago. Cynthia wanted to catch me when I was yet finding my footing. So before I share our conversation, let me say a little bit about Cynthia. She is multifaceted and multi-talented, and the through line of her work is creativity. She is a prolific writer of both fiction and nonfiction. In fact, she's writing a novel right now. Her first big work of fiction is a book called Chasing Sylvia Beach, the historic novel that takes place in the 1930s. And on the nonfiction side, she's written many things, including The Busy Woman's Guide to Writing a World-Changing Novel. So Cynthia is a writer, an artist, a coach, and a teacher, and I would call her a creative explorer. In fact, she leads retreats in Paris and other cities in Europe. And of course, like all of the most interesting people I know, she is ever the student and a lifelong learner. You can learn more about Cynthia and her work on her website, originalimpulse.com. Without further ado, here is me in conversation and being interviewed by my insightful, inciting, inspirational, and beautiful friend, Cynthia Morris. Hello, hello. Hi, Constance. So great to be with you. I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to talk to you because A, I adore you, and B, I've been listening to your podcast since the beginning, and it was really fun when you went on this epic adventure. I call it an adventure. What do you call it? Oh, that's a good question. I I, I call it an adventure. Okay. I call it an right. adventure even though it wasn't all about reporting the adventure. Yes. Before we get started, can I just say I really want to thank you for this great idea you had because no one's ever interviewed me, and I thought it was fun and playful and very much what your work is about. So thank you for the opportunity to kind of think out loud. Uh, well, I was going to thank you for letting me do it because I'm a coach. I'm going into 25 years of being a coach, which is all about asking good questions. So often I'm listening to something and I'm like, let me get in there and ask some questions. <laughs> I have the hubris to think that my questions are better. And um, so I want to just talk a little bit about my line of questioning. So when you first went on your trip, I thought, oh, this is cool. I, we love kind of riding along on somebody's magic carpet and having a secondhand experience. And like many people at first, I wanted some kind of travel log, a report, and hear how the tra travels were going. You were clear right away that that was not what your podcast was about. So I appreciated that. And I let myself go along on your ride. But I have questions. When you came back, you said, oh, you didn't want to talk about the adventure. And I thought a lot of the questions that people were asking you and that I think people ask in general have nothing to do with you and they're all about them. So the questions <laughs> of where are you going? What are you doing? And they want to know because a lot of people, myself included, have a trouble with uncertainty. So your whole trip was an experiment in uncertainty and that you we're willing to, to fly free like that. So I think that's very empowering. And it also is very disturbing for others. That's interesting. I love what you just said. An experiment in uncertainty. That's very beautiful language around it. I would say two things, actually. One is, you're right, it was an experiment in uncertainty. And I was verbalizing to people that I didn't know exactly what I was doing. Actually went into and I don't want you to be asking me where I'm going, because that was part of the adventure for me. The uncertainty or not knowing exactly where I was going and what I was doing, for me, therein lies the adventure. So if I posit that most of us don't really like uncertainty and have a hard time with it, what made you able to tolerate all that uncertainty for so long and still in, in a place of not knowing everything that's going to happen? I'm not sure. I, certainly my quiet practice contributes to that, my awareness practice around being present to what is in the moment. But I do think that it's a muscle you can flex and you can be conscientious and deliberate about saying, okay, 
I think our need to know is it's one of the most uh, deeply rooted human needs. I don't agree. I don't think it's built in. I think it's part of how we're trained. And I think it has, this is obviously my opinion. I think it has to do with the not really being able to cope with the only real certainty we have and that we're going to die and that we don't really have a lot of control over that and that we don't really have a lot of control over life in general. So this whole idea of having, I'm going to do this career for this long and I'm going to do this. If, if one person like you is the, the, the random outlier, it really shakes the boat. Like, wait, she's going out into this uncertain terrain and she's surviving and she's kind of seems like she's enjoying it. That puts everything into question about what we think, how we think it should be. I think that's a good point. And I was deliberately putting that into question, putting in my life, I was feeling very comfortable. Um, my world seemed a little bit smaller to me post COVID. And I don't think I'm unique in that. Um, and I don't want to go into a whole thing about COVID for many people. It was a very rich journey inward. For some people, you know, everybody had a different experience. But one thing that I think is very common is that people's worlds shrunk a little bit. And I felt that my world was getting too small too soon. I'm 62 years old and I felt like I was getting a little bit too comfortable in my bubble, if you will. Yeah. So I wanted to push the envelope and go outside of my comfort zone. And one of the biggest takeaways that I had from my whole experience, I think, Probably for me, the most important takeaway is that I can find my center and my groundedness wherever I am. Doesn't matter the continent, doesn't matter the language being spoken about me, it doesn't matter what bed I'm sleeping in. And we know that intellectually that security and safety comes from within. Hmm. And I flexed that muscle over and over again. It like became part of who I am. And that for me was very important because back to your point about insert uncertainty. If I mean, there are lots of things that are really rocking our world right now, wars and social unrest and millions of things. And our ability to navigate uncertainty is critically important. It is. How much did your quiet practice contribute to your ability to, and I know you can't quantify this, but I'm just wondering if that was a big lever in your ability to find home inside yourself, wherever that's, you are. That, that's, I mean, it's fundamental. It's yeah. fundamental. And, you, you know, obvious, I'm a meditator and I'm a strong believer that quiet practices can take many different forms. It can be, yeah. it can be art, it can be music, running. It doesn't matter. The point is cultivating an intentional quiet practice, which what I call it is an awareness practice yeah. and the ability to drop into your awareness and, and find that peace inside is foundational for me. I think it's a huge contributor to my ability to tolerate and to enjoy actually and make a game of not knowing and the uncertainty. Yeah, I think it seems like you have a, that awareness practice, knowing yourself, trusting yourself. And this kind of leads to a question that I have right away. You know, I think you, one of the things I love about you is you have a very active intellect and in that you also listen to and trust your intuition. So when you first got this call to leave New York and head out, I wonder if you resisted it at all. Oh, I totally resist. Actually, it happened before COVID. I've had this recurring calling to leave or to spread my wings, ask myself what freedom means to go outside my comfort zone. And it got shut down. It actually, I went to do it and I was in Europe when COVID hit and That's I came right. home. Yeah. So there's been a recurring theme of, ah, this doesn't really make sense. And why do I feel this need to do this? And I am already free by most people's uh, if you look at me, I don't have children. I don't currently don't have a partner. I, I, I have less responsibility than a lot of people. So the grass looks greener in my court. I look like I'm totally free. Yet I felt this need to explore what the next level of freedom would look like for me. Does that make sense? I think it's a quintessential call, like the, the hero's journey or the heroine's journey. It's, it's an irony to leave home to find yourself. I think, oh, wow. it, you know, I think it also really brings about this sense of um, it, it accentuates the uncertainty. I, I think that's the best thing about travel. I love to travel. I've always been a big traveler. I lead groups in other countries because I want people to have that experience of going out of your comfort zone and out of what you know. So many interesting things that you could not have controlled or contrived or planned happen. 
So this is what I love about your trip. You had all these different invitations that you accepted. Suddenly you're in Buenos Aires. Suddenly you're here. And it's just like, okay, that's really cool. So, but you said this has been in you, but you resisted. What were you resisting? Can you say a little bit more about what you mean about the heroine's journey? I love what you said about leaving home to come home to yourself. Do you know the hero's journey model? Yes. Yeah. Um, I just think it's an interesting contrast to what we were just saying about to go inward to know yourself. Here's going outward to know yourself. And we get so, I think, I, I don't know if this is an actual word, but this is the word that I use, enculturated. We, you know, like you're a New Yorker, you're an or East Side New Yorker, you, this is from the kind of family you're from, this is what you do, this is how you eat. That's how we survive. Like we kind of settle into our way. And yet there may be more to your own individual way out there. When you go out there, you encounter people and you kind of have to stand on your own merit and your own self in the moment. No one's really able to say like, oh, I know where your background is. I mean, obviously there's a surface stuff of our race and gender, yeah. but. You get set free on some level. You, oh, I feel a total freedom when I, tra I love traveling alone and that, that freedom to follow my instinct, to let life lead me. And I think there's a lot of magic there. I don't like to have a lot of things scheduled. I like to wander around. And I think that you share that. Yeah. Back to what you were asking me about the resistance. The resistance was to face a couple of my fears. One of my only predefined goals was that I wanted to conquer this absolute, um, not ridiculous, I don't want to say ridiculous, this absolute unsubstantiated or irrational fear of traveling alone. It's interesting you brought up that point because I had a very deep-seated fear of traveling alone. And a lot of people say, how can that be? You travel alone all the time. But when I travel, I tend to go, let's just say to Spain or Italy, where I lived for many, many years. So uh, what I was resisting was traveling alone, for one, and I wanted to set myself free. I wanted to face that fear and see if it was real. And if not, I felt like that would really set me free. And the other thing I was resisting was this idea that I had to speak to other people's questions, narratives, expectations. Um, yeah, it was an adventure for me, but the adventure was by me, for me. And it was not about having some great story to tell. That was hard to resist because people do, the questioning when I came home was, tell me all about your trip. How was your adventure? You know, Tell me about your journey. And it was very much a journey inward. It wasn't about telling the story and sharing my adventure. What were you afraid of with regard to traveling alone? I wasn't sure, but I've had that fear for 40 years. No pun intended, but I don't think you're alone in having that fear. Um, <laughs> I, I think, and we're used to having companionship and there are times, I mean, there's definitely times when sharing something is just way better than having it alone. And there is a lot of loneliness to traveling. Oh, alone. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. If, when I say fear, it wasn't a fear of being it hurt or unsafe or anything like that. It was a fear of being really uncomfortable. Mm. And I think that's why we stay so busy and why you have a quiet practice and that, that kind of solitude really gives you that sense of being tethered to yourself and what's true for you and whatever you're connecting to in that quiet time. Yeah. Well, there's, some, there's a lot to continue to explore. And I think... I mean, I want to acknowledge you for being brave and willing to explore that. Do you feel like you came you. further down the road around that fear? Like, where are you at with it oh, now? Oh, I totally knocked it out the second day. Okay. I went to Mexico City. I knew that I wanted to go to Mexico City, and I know that it's a big city. And I went with my New York energy, and I had a blast. So, okay, I'm just like over here, like flailing around, because this is what is so cool about travel. It's It's a very clear, like... Now and then, like you're at home and you're in this experience and it's almost like a bubble around your head, like some kind of George Jetson bubble that contains all your beliefs and thoughts about yourself and life. And I'm afraid and here's my limit. And then you get out there and it's like the minute you get out there and you step off of that treadmill, you're like, oh, this is great. I what just was I this thinking? cool guy. Well, and you can't, you were thinking. 
we can't know it until we experience it. And I go through this too. I travel a lot. I travel alone. I lead groups. It's, I'm, you know, it would look like intrepid, but every time totally scared right before I go on the plane <laughs> over, I'm like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? It's, it's a big deal. I don't want to minimize it just because it's like, oh, I do it all the time. What's the deal? Like it's, it is a big deal. And, um, I love this conversation we're having. I think it is largely about the relationship we have with ourselves and how we think about the world. I would agree. I agree with that. So that, that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why this is so much more interesting than what was it like in Buenos Aires? So tell me about that. You had that great story with the jewelry person. And like, it's like, okay, that's not the story. Can I tell you something else that I got out of it that I thought was really fun for me? Yes. I am a very intuitive person and I was lucky that I've cultivated that from a very young age because when my mother got angry at me, she used to always say to me, don't give me that baloney. Tell me what your intuition says. You know. And she used to get up in my face and say, you know. And so there was kind of a value in my family about respecting and trusting your intuition. And I really loved... I bought one-way tickets everywhere I went for the first several months. And everybody would say, would you know what's next? Even though I had said, please don't ask me that. I don't know. That's part of my adventure. But what was really cool was I just knew when it was time to go. I felt it in my body over and over again, this, oh, I think I'm done here. And that was as simple as it sounds. That was a really beautiful thing. That knowingness, it was it was playing with my knowingness and my intuition in a different way. Yeah. And and it sounds like it was very embodied. Oh, absolutely embodied. So you talked about your third act and you're not really certain what that is or what that's going to look like. And I'm wondering, it's almost like you went out on this journey and came back. Playful. Like a, I came back playful. Oh, nice. And and also turbocharged your your knowing, your intuition. Yes. That's that's a good way to put it. It turbocharged certainly my willingness to, my knowingness about this and my willingness to, it's funny, we're just coming full circle here. It's a very uncertain thing I'm doing. And it's not, it's, this I think is brave if you want to be, if, if you want me to be honest. At my age in New York City, almost 63 years old, declaring to the world that I want to have a third act, that I'm willing and ready to work for someone or to create something. That feels brave to me, and it feels like I'm dancing with uncertainty again here. But I came back, that's a good way to put a turbocharge with this, okay, I don't know, but I'm going to, I'm going to get curious about it and see what I can, see what, see what shows up for me. But I do want to be more playful with it and not take it so seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I think that. I think the answer will be revealed to me, and it may be that that's not my path. Yep. And the sense of bringing play and levity and your instinct to whatever you do next will serve you really well. I hope so. I think so, too. I know the world has its bullshit about age and especially women and what it means and all that. Um, I hear you get you're kind of attached to how old you are. And I didn't really know your age until recently. And so I was always like, of course she's going to do some more work because you, you're so rich, so rich. In, in experience and you have so much uh, left to offer. You're just, your dynamism, your in, in interest in the world and people, your generosity, you just, you're not done being Thank engaged. You, Thank so you. I don't have this. I'm not 62, so I don't, I can't sit in your seat, but what if, what's your attachment to that aside from the cultural bullshit? I, it's not an attachment to it. It's I, I really want to own it. Like I did a photo shoot in Milan because I wanted to be photographed. I feel attractive and vibrant. And I just, something shifted. And I said, I'm going to own this. I'm going to get a kick-ass photo of myself looking hot and looking elegant and looking, you know, something that reflects how I'm feeling. And I think I've been trying to avoid that. I've yeah. Been, I don't know. It's my own little dance. Well, it's owning who you are, how you are at this point in your life. And I love the photo shoot and I love the photo and I don't really look at it and think all those things you think. I'm not looking for that. You know, we're looking like we're checking, like, do I still look good? Am I still (laughs) like, do I have the beauty? What I see is your, your very unique energy 
and your vibe. And there is that playfulness and mischievousness and um, let's do this people. Like I'm here, mm -hmm. I'm here to, to play. So I'm not here trying to just like fluff you up or anything, but it doesn't hurt to fluff a little. I mean, I'm just saying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. What feels different for you now? Can you identify one or two things that have changed for you since you left in October? That's a good question. Well, I think we just spoke about one that I want to embrace where I am in my life right now and not model that, but own it. And what else has changed for me? I, I got some answers. Rather than change, I think I got some of the answers that I didn't know I was looking for. Mm. One is that I'm not done with New York. This feels like home to me right now. And I'm holding it a little more loosely, if you will. Um, I got the answer that I'm willing to own that I'd like to explore a third act. That is something that I've been dancing around. And I came back with this, like I just said, a much more playful, lighter, with a lot more levity around that subject. I think it's something that a lot of people are thinking about. A lot of people around me don't know what to do with that desire to do more, to contribute more, to explore more in their lives. So um, what was the question? Change, well, what what's changed? changed? So you mentioned that the certainty about New York and the certainty about the second act. So, and also really leading a little more with playfulness. Yeah. And I thought, I'm not sure I can, I'm not sure I can think of what has changed. I came back also with this idea of what I call renegotiating my relationship with home and with New York. Um, you know, that's one of the great beauties of travel. You come back with fresh eyes, fresh perspective, fresh ideas. And I'm really hoping to maintain some of that, bring, to really integrate that into my life here. I've been here for 18 years, so it's very easy to fall back into old patterns. And I tend to spend way too much time alone and I err on the side of staying quiet and staying at home, even though that seems strange to people because I'm always telling stories about things I'm doing. I spend a tremendous amount of time alone. So I came back really with this idea of, yes, I want to have a different relationship with this city. I'm, I'm, I'm in a new phase. I'm a different person right now. I came back changed and I want to inter integrate that into my life. And I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I have been thinking about it every day since I got home. Yeah, I love that. I've been studying story as I write my novel and I'm learning so much. And there's the, the surface story. Like I went here, I did this. And, and then there's the, the, I call it the undergarments or the understory. It's the character arc. Like what, what's happened to you, who, how you've gone from this kind of person to this kind of person. And as I'm learning how to write, that's the thing you have to know as a writer. Like you think, oh, I know the, the outline of what happens. And that's not what you need to know. You need to know what's going on underneath. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's what you really have a sense of what's going on underneath. And you don't necessarily have the outline of what it's going to look like or what it looked like. So mm -hmm. you were really leading with the character of you, the, the person of you being about that inner growth and not just like, oh, here's what I did. Here's a picture of me in front of the blah, blah. Yeah. Interestingly, one thing that's popping up to me at hearing you speak is I've noticed very clearly that my energy since I've come back and the way I'm interacting with people is eliciting a different response and it's more Ooh. satisfying and I'm having more quality conversations. Yeah. I'm, I'm attracting what I'm putting out basically yeah. and I can really see that. It's, it feels good. Yeah. And even, you know, I, you know, the, the tell me how, what's the best thing you did or what was most exciting? Like, I hate those superlative questions. But I find them very hard to answer. And even the question I just asked one or two things, we're trying to pinpoint the ineffable, but you're feeling it and you, you know it, and you just described it. Like I, my interactions in the world have a different flavor and I'm having a different experience. That's exactly it. I don't have to describe how I've changed. I don't have to know it or market. When I came back from my year living the way you did a little more itinerant lifestyle, I was so much more confident. I had so much confidence. And I think I still have that because I did things that I, very few people I know would have done and alone. And most of the people I met were like, what, you're alone? So that was this great kind of, it wasn't a trophy or anything external, but internal. Um, I found hugely, and I didn't get what I wanted. I, I was trying to do the specific thing, didn't get it. 
failed, or you could say it was a fail. And yet that thing that I got that I didn't know I needed uh, serves me. I have one more question. I love what you just said about not knowing what you needed, discovering what you needed. I didn't know why I was going, except for the storyline I had in my head, which is I wanted to get over this fear of traveling alone. And I wanted to exercise that muscle of that sort of dance with uncertainty. That was just to be able to say something. I didn't know what I needed to find. That's the dance with the divine. That's, that's, yes, that, that is the dance is, with the divine. If you really believe that there's more to life than what is visible, um, that's what you're experiencing. Like you don't have that control. And that's what I think I get frustrated when everybody wants to know the specific certainty and have the answers. There's going to be so much way better experience than you could ever contrive. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's the dance with the divine. Call Absolutely. that. This is the title for the podcast episode. <laughs> I love that. So I'm writing a novel and it's about somebody who goes out of their own culture and tries to live in another culture. So, so much of what you were experiencing, I was like having conversations with you all the time <laughs> in my kitchen, making my coffee. And <laughs> especially cool. when you were the episode, when you were talking about living in Milan and living in Italy all those years and that you're like, I'm never going to belong here. I don't belong. So that, that was just fascinating to me. And really this theme of belonging is a big theme in my book and in my life. So I'm curious for you, I'd like to hear a little more about what does it mean for you to belong? How do you know when you belong? It's interesting. I don't remember having said that I didn't belong. I'm also interested in the theme of belonging. Let me backtrack just a minute and say that I lived as a foreigner for over 20 years in Europe. And my reckoning back then was about embracing my American self and not trying to fit in. I was a young woman and I was married and things were different. People weren't as open-minded. They weren't as traveled as they are now. Life was different, obviously. Having said that, I had this big aha that I would never be, air quotes, one of them. And that freed me to be more myself when I was there. Hmm. I don't know. As it relates to belonging, I think I would say feeling welcome and hmm. loved is different from belonging. And I do feel welcome and loved there. And I don't even know how to answer the question. Where do you feel you belong now? I would say that belonging for me is it place or people specific? I guess that's what I'd say. Now, maybe that's a narrative in my head because I was a foreigner for so many years. Maybe it's because I have a small family at this point. Most people have passed. My tribe is very small. So the belonging really has to come from within. And I don't think I said that I didn't belong in Italy. Um, I think you said, what, I'm not one of them. I'm never I am not one, one of them. them. And that is something that I've had to say and learn many times over because I've become very close with various families in my life. And it was very important for me to say, I love you and I feel a part of your family. And I am not a family member. I am not a native Italian. And I love them and I feel loved and, and I feel welcome. But the belonging is, is, is within. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I just think that the world right now is really just this giant diaspora and more and more people are moving because they're forced to or because they want to. And this whole idea that we're supposed to stay within our nation state, um, that's where we belong. It's, it it's just doesn't, it's just not true anymore. Well, I do think there's a connection between feeling welcome and being treated fairly and finding your place within a community that can help someone uh, feel safer and yeah. find that sense of belonging from within. Yeah. Uh, I do think that they're, they're inextricably linked. Yes. And the safety it, of feeling welcomed. Yes. It, it's, it's incredibly difficult in my experience to live in another culture and people who are able to do it. That's one of the reasons I respect you so much. Like, wow, you did that. Like I, I have a tiny sliver of understanding of what that requires. And I love that ultimately you came around to your own selfness and that part of that is being an American. Like that's the very specific yeah. thing. <laughs> I, one thing I would add to that and that one of the important things that happened to me at the end of my experience is I extended beyond the original thinking of five months and I 
really felt called to go back to Spain, which is a place I love because there is a area of Spain where I thought maybe I might spend more time in the future. And it was worth its weight in gold, that trip, because when I got there, and this speaks to being a foreigner and belonging, it was not my place. And it really made me realize that should I decide to spend more time in Europe or should I want or need to move back to Europe, it would absolutely be Italy. And that was a very important thing to discover. And I, I don't even know how to explain how important that was for me. And it reminded me of when I was on sabbatical. I had been in Europe for about 15 years, 16 years, and I had got a sabbatical. And I went to San Francisco and Chicago and New York and L.A. And when I went back to Italy, I thought to myself, well, if I ever go back to the States, at which point I didn't think I was ever going to move back here, I know I'm going to New York. So when the moment came that it was my time to leave Europe, I knew unequivocally that I was coming to New York. And that's how I felt about the trip to Spain. It was like, I, I don't want to find my place of welcome here. I don't want to go through again, building community, working on my language skills and integrating myself into another country. If I'm going to do that, it's going to be Italy. That's great. I want to just kind of underline something that you just said and then um, wrap it up here. We said something that I don't know how to explain it. And I feel like you set out, and I think you might always have been like this, but you really set out and along the way you said like, I can't explain it. Don't ask me to explain it. And I just want to underline that and bold that for you. Like you don't ever have to explain in th these kind of situations. Like it's not about shoring up your reasons or making sure anybody else understands because your experience is so much that dance of the divine. It is so connected to your own true knowing. And that is not always something you can package up in a clear explanation. And I think we just lose a lot of our, we lose a little bit of traction or self-connection when we're desperately trying to make sure other people understand. Yeah, thank you for saying that. That's an important point. The other thing I would say as we end here is that I know in my heart that many people don't entertain the dance with uncertainty until something bad happens in their lives. and. That is also part of why I went. I, I think we don't know. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And I really wanted to cultivate that sense of adventure and not wait for an inciting incident. In, the, in your story arc line, there was no inciting incident. Yeah, I call that the cosmic shove. Like you're shoved out of your life as you know it, like from some exactly. terrible thing. Like, I don't want that either. So I'll take the, the invitations that come from within. Um, Anything you want to say to wrap up? Anything we haven't discussed? No, but I want to thank you for asking me. I mean, you can tell I have not fully metabolized. and I'm still in the midst of thinking about where I've been over the last months. But thank you for giving me the opportunity to uncover some of the goals together. My pleasure. Thanks for saying yes. Bye, Cynthia. Bye, Constance. Great talking to you. You too. Wow. I hope you enjoyed that. It was interesting to listen to it again for me as well because I can see that in just a couple of weeks, things have shifted so much. Again, if you want to learn more about Cynthia and her work, go to originalimpulse.com. That's all for now. Until next time, from my heart to yours. Mm -hmm.